the idea for my book published last year originated from insights throughout the years about the perceived changes in my students and their blindness to context due to digital technologies. My current research began again with my confusion and amazement about my students. Only this time, it is their seeming inability to think abstractly and their lack of awareness of the process of abstracting that triggered what I hope is the beginning of a new book. It all began in a course I teach called Us on the Screen that deals with representation, hoping to help them gain some theoretical insights into the jobs they will soon hold in the media industry. I ask them for their papers to pick a media profession, journalism, PR, advertising, to find a film or television series that portrays it and analyze its representation. For the first time since I have taught the course, I had a few students whose topic suggestions revealed they had trouble distinguishing between a news anchor on their television screens presenting the news every night, a movie where the same anchor is portrayed by an actor, and a movie where she makes a guest appearance as herself. In trying to understand why they were having a tough time understanding the idea of representation, I found out it was much deeper than I thought. For example, they did not think of their social media accounts as representations of themselves, but as part of their selves, as real as their physical persons in my office at that very moment. Over a decade ago, Sherry Turkle um, talked about multi-lifing or the life mix as she calls it, our move in and out of social media and other platforms continuously throughout the day. But these students do not think of their Instagram accounts as a platform they go in and out of. And their image on screens is not separate from themselves. Perhaps this is the next logical step after technological convergence, the bringing of technologies together into a single device. Perhaps the smartphone, the ultimate example of technological convergence, brought about self-convergence or the convergence of our on and offline selves, doing away with our understanding of the concept of representation in the process. The selfie has become the most common type of shot, the most prevalent one online, and only boomers ask waiters to take pictures of their parties. When we were kids, we saw ourselves maybe once or twice a day. We took pictures only at special occasions like birthdays or traveling, we organized the photographs in albums and looked at them only once in a very long while. The relative rarity of these events made it possible for us to understand our reflections and our photographs as representations of ourselves. But when people see themselves tens of times during the day and watch and share their videos or stories constantly over the course of a day, there are no more events, only pseudo events. People's reflections become part of themselves. In this context, it makes perfect sense that a student in another class of mine chose to write his media history paper on the invention of the mirror, and most of his examples were about phone cameras and selfies. It makes sense that people want plastic surgery to look more like their own Instagram filter. They don't understand reflections, reflections since they live in a self-reflexive loop. Nowhere is this clearer than in the genre of parents and infants facing the camera on Instagram and TikTok. Their interactions are mediated by screens. They talk to each other while looking at the camera, not at each other. And they're constantly looking at themselves. Here are a few examples so you see what I mean. Two of them are from Israel, one is from Argentina, that's fine. The language spoken is the least important element here. This Israeli father cooks with his daughter for their followers. Notice how she talks to an audience with all the mannerisms of a child star. 
only child actors in the past never saw themselves while performing. This influencer shares infinite details of her life and her daughters with her half a million followers daily. Look at them talk to each other, not looking at each other, but at themselves and the other on screen. Safta, Ari, Okay, she is really cute, but it's sickening. Uh, I, at least I think so, and I'll tell you why. This is not just about exposing a child before they're old enough to consent. It is about what will happen to toddlers' development of self. Recognizing themselves in the mirror by about age two has been an indication of the beginning of self-awareness for a very long time. But what are the implications to self-awareness when the self-directed cameras are omnipresent? Their real lives and their reflections have merged or converged and they may be losing their ability to tell them apart. Meanwhile, after exposing her since birth, this influencer mom has asked her followers to disregard her daughter when they encounter her on the street so that she can have a normal life. This mother was having a wonderful conversation with her daughter, facing her for a change, but the camera is there, of course, and the interaction is over when the baby discovers herself. Okay. Especially worrisome is the case of TikTok challenges such as this grotesque one. The face of the parent turns into a horse accompanied by a scary sound. Notice the children's reactions and especially their obvious confusion about where the parent is, holding them or on the screen. I hope it is clear now uh, why I think the concept of representation is hard for some to understand. And if we take it a step further, I believe it may explain, at least partially, people's inability to abstract and their lack of awareness of the process of abstraction. Representation always involves a certain degree of abstraction, that is, the removal of characteristics from the original. So if our Facebook self or our Instagram or TikTok self is not separate from our self in real life, if it is not a representation or an abstraction of our real life self, there's also no abstraction. It may be that the hyper-visual lives with social media, the internet, the selfie and its derivatives have contributed to our impaired ability for abstract thought. A friend who I have known for years lately found out he has a condition called 
aphantasia or aphantasia, the inability to visualize images. The inability to, I don't know why that happened, but okay. The inability to voluntarily form mental images was first described by Francis Galton in 1880, but it wasn't until 2015, a study in 2015, that cognitive neurologist Adam Zeman labeled the condition aphantasia. People with this con condition experience difficulty picturing scenes or objects in their mind. They can experience a host of challenges. The inability to recall faces or familiar places can cause frustration and social difficulties. When the mind's eye cannot see, counting sheep or navigating streets with a mental map can be impossible. No visual worlds are entered when reading a novel. And aphantasia also implies poor autobiographical memory. Still, Dr. Zeman considers it merely a difference in perception and reports that many affants who have contacted him are working successfully in creative, creative fields such as art or architecture. Many don't discover that their experience is any different from that of others until their late teens or early 20s. It might be while reminiscing about the past and realizing they're having a different experience with memory than their friends or family. It's not that they don't notice that they don't visualize, they just don't know that other people do. Some draw on other mental senses, such as what we might call the mind's ear, like reading notes aloud to themselves and relying on auditory recall on tests, but that doesn't work for everybody. Approximately half the people who contacted Dr. Zeman about their aphantasia also described an inability to conjure sounds, feelings, or smells in their minds. Still, could aphantasia be a blessing in disguise? My friend Dan, from whom I first learned about aphantasia, was an Israeli prisoner of war in Syria during the 1973 war uh, of Yom Kippur. He was shot down while parachuting from his plane, taken hostage and tortured, and he does not suffer from PTSD. He can retell the suffering but he's not awakened at night by images of the horrors he experienced. Could this be due to his aphantasia or did he become an affant as a result of the trauma? Scientists have identified two types of the disorder, acquired aphantasia, which can occur after a brain injury or after periods of depression or psychosis, and congenital aphantasia, which is present at birth. Either way, his memories of his time as a POW are stories, verbal descriptions, and connections up and down the ladder of abstraction. Some studies have identified that Afans have strong abstract thinking skills. Oliver Sachs, who himself lacked a mind's eye, once used amphetamines to help him conjure up images. But as he describes in his book, Musicophilia, I could hold very accurate and stable visual images in my mind and trace them on paper as with a camera lucida. My enjoyment of these newfound powers was mitigated, however, by finding that my abstract thinking was extremely compromised. The ability to visualize is key in many areas of life, of course. With athletes, for example, the same areas of the brain light up when they visualize their upcoming performances, improving those very same perform performances through visualization and not just actual practice. But abstract thought and a powerful mind's eye apparently do not make good bedfellows. And so my thesis here considers the possibility that aphantasia, the absence of a mind's eye in a hypervisual era, may have some benefits. It may aid abstract thought and awareness of abstraction. It may help maintain an understanding of the self as separate from its representations and our identities as separate from our avatars on the metaverse. Thank you very much.